the Remarkable People podcast. Check it out. The Remarkable People podcast. Listen, do, repeat for life. Hello, friends. I'm David Pasqualone, and welcome to the Remarkable People podcast. This week, we have a special guest, Matthew Temple. Matthew is a producer, a filmmaker, and a romantic. He talks about his life story and not just what he learned from his own experiences, but what he learned wisely through his mother and father and then his own experiences. And like all of us, we're on our journey through life and we're in different places and we're growing and we're helping one another grow. So this is an episode that like a lot of our episodes goes deep into the guest story, but it has a lot of practical pieces we can pull out into our own lives. And then Matt's just a cool guy and a remarkable friend. He's got a great story to share. And as we're listening, we're not only going to be entertained, but we can check out some of his work. I'll put links in the show notes. And then you can glean what he's communicating to you about life and love and our journey together. So my name is David Pasqualone. Thank you for being here today. And in the theme of love and today when I'm recording this, it's my daughter's 17th birthday. Take a few seconds, text somebody you love them, write them. Call them up if you haven't spoken with them and just say, hey, I was just thinking of you. You're on my heart. I love you. And if you have extra time, go on to Apple, Spotify, YouTube, leave us a five-star rating and comment. Subscribe if you haven't already. And that's it. I'm going to stop talking. Enjoy this episode, The Remarkable People Podcast, with our guest and friend, The Remarkable Matthew Temple. Hey, Matthew, how are you today, brother? Life is good. Life is really good. Thank you. Yeah. And and where, yeah, where are you today? Where are we speaking to you out of? I'm in Petaluma, California. Very nice. uh, Yeah, where we've been probably about 15 minutes to the beach and about 45 minutes north of San Francisco. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Pretty good space to be. Yeah. Yeah, And so we're going to start our interview today and we're going to go off into your story And just like as our listeners know, we have listeners from all over the globe. And the journey we're going to take today is go through your past, the journey to where you are today, and then where you're heading in the future. So you help us at the beginning. What did you face? What did you have to overcome in your life and the practical steps, how you did it? And then we'll transition to where are you today so we as the listeners can get behind you and help you get there. Sound good? I love it. Love it. All right, man. Then let's go deep. You were born. What time and where? No, I'm just kidding. Let's, go. <laughs> let's start off in your childhood because that's what forms us. So tell us, how did Matthew Temple get formed? You know, at the, I, I was born, so my, I was born in Los Angeles to a Jewish mother and a Christian father. And uh, I was the first born. And I, I learned recently, actually, I was doing some biography work and I just had this a kind of like, I had a really good childhood, I should say. But there was this, at one point, I thought, you know what? There are, when I think back of everything that I remember, things were really good. But I also know there were traumas or there were things that were going on that I didn't understand. And I was like, well, from the time when I could understand, I can process that stuff. But then there's things that came before I had, was fully aware or conscious. And there were things there. And I was wondering, like, what was that? And this was actually after my mother had passed away. And I called my dad and I was like, I just need to spend some time on the phone with you, getting to know about what was going on in basically in my life from conception until my, my next brother was born when I really started having memories. And one of the things that he filled in for me was that right, I think it was during my, the, when my mother was pregnant, my grandmother was diagnosed with terminal lung cancer. And so all of a sudden there was this weight in some ways on who I was in, you know, to my family, to my mother, to my grandmother. And, and 
and I kind of, I guess I would say that 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 weight there was a responsibility around that there was i was this joy right i was like thank god that this sun is coming to us you know and in the jewish tradition the you're named after the dead commonly but using just the first the first letter so my my mother's father had already passed away his name was moisha or morris and i'm matthew and so i was kind of brought I was brought into the world as this great gift, but obviously there's, there's expectation with that gift, right? To perform, to be something. And then after my grandmother passed away, in some ways there was the sense of that, oh, my mom also, like that, that she was missing her mother so much, almost put this outsized proportion of love and veneration on me. And as an oldest son of a Jewish mother, and this whole this whole story was something that that I know impacted me in so many ways of like really just wanting to be of service, to be there. And I see that as you know, it has all these amazing impacts. Right? I love being of service, but then there were also times in my life where I kind of forgot that you know, there's a reason why on an airplane you put on the your oxygen mask before you put on. The one sitting next to you you want to make sure that you're safe and healthy or whatever and that you're going to survive the difficulties so that way you have what you need to help others and i think that was one thing that when i kind of go back into my biography i was like oh it took me many many years to finally come around to realize i actually have to take care of myself to take care of others so that was where i came in and i lived in los angeles until i was nine and at that point, then I kind of started a series of a lot of moves. My dad moved the family to, to Denver for four years. I joked that he tried to postpone his midlife crisis by moving the family to Mexico for a year. I, in all earnestness, say he succeeded in postponing it. <laughs> he didn't eradicate it, but he postponed it, which was great. But I had this amazing experience of living in Mexico and then moved back to North, uh, Northern California. And then kind of since then continued to live around the globe and, and even around the United States. So, yeah. Awesome. Now, how many brothers and sisters did you have total? I have two younger brothers. Two younger yeah. brothers. And then how long was it before the next brother was born? So my next brother is almost four years younger than me. And then the next one came two years out, about two years after that. Okay, so you can have some clear memories up to four years old and a lot of the forming. I know my grandmother died when I was four and a half, but yeah. I still remember her vividly in lots of accounts. Sure. So it's like you, you did have that just impressionable state. So the relationship with your mom and dad, how was that in the home? Like looking back now, did they have a good relationship? Was it strained? How, how was that that it formed you without you even knowing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, well, my, right before my next brother was born, my parents just about didn't make it. And, and so, and I, once again, I've also recognized that in more of my research in, in developmental psychology, and I say this not as a, as a, as a, academic student, but as a life student and as a, as a, as a reader, you know, some of the, you know, the impacts of, you know, my, the, I wouldn't maybe say some of the emotional connection missing from my parents. And so how I picked up some of that in, to serve that, you know, to be this emotional, you know, emo having this emotional connection to my mother. But, you know, my parents also have functioned very well together and there was generally there was peace in the household and but not necessarily you know it was it was almost like i could say my parents had a had a fraternal type of love not necessarily an eros type of love you know so there was definitely you know some of the passion might not have been there or whatever but they they functioned well and they were so different that those compliments were also could be both it was stratifying but also like i got these two very very different ways of approaching the world you know my mother was very phlegmatic she spent a lot of her life very overweight and was really hard to budge to do something she didn't want to do 
But once she got into going, she really, like, she was one of the most adaptable, malleable people I ever knew. But she resisted any change in her life, you know, kicking and screaming. So, it, for example, when when my dad wanted to move the family to Mexico, my mother definitely was like, you know, did not want to do it. This is crazy. But then she went and she was, you know, everywhere she went, my people loved my mother because she was so easy. When we moved to Denver, even before that, she didn't really want to go. She had family. She was close to both of her brothers were in Los Angeles. Cousins were there. She didn't want to go. And then she stepped in and in, into a world there and was just such a beacon of light to so many people. So I had that and then a father that, you know, was kind of on the opposite side, very sort of sanguine, very interested in a lot of things. I like to start things, but wasn't necessarily a follow through you know, so, but yeah, just, I mean, my childhood was pretty special. Uh, just a lot of adventure and also a ton of freedom. My parents gave me so much freedom. And, you know, when I think back to the things that my parents let me do both, as a like, preteen and as a younger boy, then even as a teenager, like I hitchhiked, I hitchhiked all over the globe as a teenager. I mean, like that's crazy. And the fact that my parents let me do that was bonkers. But the experiences that I had and the people that I met and the innate trust that I built in the world is something that serves me so well today. And I'm so, I'm just so grateful for that, you know, and and this is going to sort of veer off from that. But when I was nine years old, my best friend died. And, and the, he basically became my, my true spiritual guide for the next about four years of my life. And one of the great things that I got from that experience was I lost my fear of death because Jesse was not afraid of death. And he was talking about it in the weeks leading up to his death. He would talk about death a lot and how he wasn't afraid to go. And that relationship and that connection that then I then had with, with Jesse was then allowed me to live life fully in this where I realized the most scary part of life is death. And if I'm not afraid to die, then I'm also not afraid to live fully. And my parents supported that in a way that was kind of beyond comprehension. Uh, and I am just forever grateful that they gave me that, that freedom and that trust. And it made me into this unusually competent human being because I loved the challenge I loved and I didn't, nobody ever said, wait, you don't know how to do that. Or no one ever said to me, be careful, you know? And I hear like that all the time with parents who say, be careful, be careful, be careful. You know, we don't do that. Don't eat this. Don't whatever, you know? And, and I never had any of that. And the brilliance of that was that, did I get burned sometimes? Of course I did. Was I in danger sometimes? Of course I was. But we're in danger anyways. Like life, the earth is not a a safe place. And so I think that was this thing that I really got from my parents that was so beautiful was, you know, they trusted me and they trusted the world. And sometimes even now, when I look at my dad, he's the most trusting of the world person I've ever met to the point where every once I'm like, my dad is just an idiot. Like you've got to, you know, pay more attention to like crap. You got to be ready to you know, you've got to be ready for the worst. And my dad is never ready for the worst. And he's only ready for the good. And when the worst comes, it's just not the worst for him. He's just like, well, this is what, this is what my karma, this is what my destiny, this is what, you know, God had in store for me. This is, this is my life. And so there's never any desire that things are different. And it is beautiful to watch. And I definitely forget that at times. <laughs> and uh, I love it. So, you know, I was, I may have mentioned, I lived in, I was living in Kenya for a couple of years before this just recently. And, and when I was, I had my first child, I just turned 20. So it was basically, I'm, you know, I was, my, my ex was pregnant all the way, you know, through being 19. And, and even when I was 16, I went and lived abroad for a semester or 15, I guess. Yeah, it was 15 when I left. So 
I was, I never really lived close to my family since I was a kid. And even during my childhood, during my teen years, I spent a lot of time traveling on my own. And just six months ago, seven months ago, I moved back to when COVID hit and I was living in Kenya and I moved back and living close to my dad and my brothers. And this reminder of the way my dad is like, sometimes, you know, he's getting older and, and there's, you know, his wife's having some, some health issues. And I'm like, you got to be more worried. You got to do more. You got to do more. And he's so happy go lucky. And then he finally goes to the doctor and deals with the doctor's like, you're actually doing everything you can be doing. And he just doesn't worry about anything. And it's man, like if everybody was like my dad, like a lot of stuff wouldn't get done, but we'd be much happier people. He's the most generous person I've ever met. Both of my parents, like they were so, so different, but the one thing they had in common is they were insanely generous I remember when early 2000s was when my parents got divorced. So I'd already, you know, it was after I was married. I had, you know, all my children at that point. And, you know, my, my mother lost her. She, like all of her kids had finally moved out. The dog died. My dad moved out. She lost her job. She was going on a hike. She broke her ankle, you know, out, like in the woods had to have paramedics come and haul her out and she was unemployed for over a year but yet my mother on when she she went to like these you know old folks homes and donated her time to take old people to go shopping she knew there was this old old older woman who lived there who who loved certain things from different places. And my mother would drive to like five different stores to make sure this woman got all the things she wanted. Even when my mother had no money and it was crazy. And that was something both of my parents had was this innate trust in the world and this generosity that, you know, that like, you know, that mother Teresa would have something to learn from. Well, let's do this. We covered a lot of ground. We sure did. And we have some gaps. Yeah, man, that was awesome. We had some gaps in the story. And we have listeners from all different cultures and nations. I want to hit a couple things before we go on. Mm -hmm. You talked about the main three types of love. Some people aren't familiar with that. So go ahead and cover the agape, phileo, and eros love. I think you mentioned two, but just cover real quick those three so people understand that background you were talking about. Yeah. Well, the, you know, the, the Eros love obviously being the passion, the passion love, which in some ways also is a love that is temporal, right? It doesn't exist usually forever. Sexual it's, desires and that kind of yeah, passion. Yeah, right. Love. It's yep. the thing that kind of gets us in, right? The agape love is being this sort of uh, this higher love, this one that sort of permeates all, all things. You mentioned the second one. I mentioned for eternal love, which is, you know, the, the love between phileo. siblings, as it were. But, yeah. Right. Phileo, okay, brotherly so. love. Yep. Yep. So yep. I just want people to understand that, um, that that frame of reference in what you're doing. And then let's park right. a little bit with your dad. How old is he now? He is 71 years old. Yeah. Okay. And in relatively good health. Yes. Yeah. Shockingly. <laughs> I mean, maybe it, well, not talking. It takes to be care of himself, but yeah, no, it's because uh, everybody I've ever met that has what you're describing personality as a father, mother, anybody, they usually live yeah. without any injuries, without any fear. They have no diseases. They just enjoy life and they live long, happy lives. So that's why I was guessing yeah. you, your dad's going to be older and healthy and probably live longer than we will, maybe. Yeah, he's got it's 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 pretty phenomenal. Which, since you asked that, I'm just going to follow that up with my mother spent most of her life overweight, as I mentioned. And when, even when my oldest daughter was born, she ended up in the hospital twice during my oldest daughter's first year of life. And I remember my mother said, you know what, if I don't get my act together, I am, I'm going to, like, I'm gonna not going to get to see my grandchildren grow up. And somehow she couldn't get her act together until my dad left her. And then she went into this deep spiral and just like one thing after the other, just everything was going wrong. It was as though the world had been saying for a long time, Annie, you got to get your crap together. Like, come on, like level up, level up. We know you can do it. 
and she couldn't. And then there was this period of time where she just truly hit rock bottom. And when she did, her life just turned around. You know, she lost almost all the weight. I mean, my mother was, I think, 320 pounds at her heaviest. And, you know, in her last years of life, she was, you know, she was a perfectly normal weight. My mother was someone who just carried, you know, she was so gregarious and joyful and happy. But, you know, there was, there's nothing like that much weight to say there's something going on underneath that I haven't processed. And she did process that. And then, so she became this incredible inspiration to so many people, not because she lost so much weight, which of course is inspirational, but, but kind of who she became in her community, in the world, and what the losing of the weight represented, which was finding her joy, taking care of herself. And when I was younger, she, lived, she tried to live vicariously through her sons. And then at a certain point, she was like, you know what? No, I'm living for myself. And she just found these ways to get through it that were so beautiful that, and she had found so much joy in her life that she died of, of lung cancer. She had terminal lung cancer, but she had so much joy that she had no idea. She went into the hospital on a Friday thinking she had pneumonia. They gave her some medicine, say, you know what? You, seem, you don't seem like you're in great shape. Spend the night. The next day, gave her medication. She wasn't better. 10 days after checking into the hospital, my mother died of terminal lung cancer. When, wow. they, when they finally found the cancer through a CAT scan, which took them three times to find it, because for some reason they couldn't find it, they also found that her spine was basically completely destroyed by the cancer as well. They couldn't believe that my mother could still stand. So, you know, and I, I'm just bringing that up because this joy that she had finally found. And when you talk about this, you know, my dad living long, my mother didn't live long. And I think the toll of so much stuff earlier in her life eventually caught up with her. But she, when, I, when she died, that week was one of the most beautiful weeks of my life. The way my brothers and I connected and being with my mother as she was departing, there was... Not not to say we didn't cry our eyes out and everything, but but we there was this recognition that she had come to the earth and done what she came for, that she didn't need to stay around any longer because she had actually done it. She got to the point where she had healed this this stuff she had and you know, she carried grudges, not many, but a few. And those few were really, really deep, deep grudges. And I remember when I walked into the room just a couple days before she died, and she was basically holding on to say goodbye to me because within an hour after I got there, she went into, she basically went into a coma and was gone. Oof, and I'll get emotional too, talking about it a bit. <laughs> It was like she was just waiting for me to say goodbye. And I came and I, I read, I said goodbye. And I, my daughters had written her a, you know, a get well soon card because none of us knew she was dying. We all thought that I was going to go, we we're going to go talk to the doctors about a treatment plan. And I just, I talked to her for a few minutes. I read the, the three, the three letters. And as soon as I was done, I sensed her she was slipping away and I was like, oh, and I want to show you, we made you a little movie, me and my daughters, we made her a stop motion film and I can, I can give it to you, you can put it in the show notes. It was this little two minute stop animation short film I made with my kids that it ended up actually playing in festivals, uh, film festivals all over, all over the world. But I was like, oh mom, and like we did this and I, I want to show, I want to show you, it's not quite ready yet, but I want to show it to you. And I pulled out my laptop and I realized I pulled it out and I was about to hit play or maybe I even hit play and I looked over and her eyes were closed and I realized that the reason why I wanted to show her now is I knew she was leaving and I, I, I could just feel it go I could feel it going and I just wanted to hold on to her a little bit longer but but she was done she had done what she had come for and so that's part of what made this such a beautiful such a a, a beautiful week was 
she had done it. And when she did, I just felt in the room, she had forgiven everybody. She had forgiven those who had aggrieved her, who had trespassed against her. And, and that was one of the most beautiful feelings in the world. And I think that's why it was also so amazing as I, I felt the way she let that go. And I often think that, you know, we think of love as sort of the, the sort of the highest, I don't know what the word is, sort of the highest state that we as human beings can aspire to is this great love, this agape love, this godly veneration love. But I was like, wait, you know, that's actually easy. Love is not hard. <laughs> love is easy. It's the getting there that's hard. And it's all the stuff that we build up. And I think it's Rumi even who said, right, it's, that love is, that we're not here, you know, that that our sort of our task is not necessarily to find love, to, but to break down the barriers that we built against it. And, and so I kind of feel that actually forgiveness is this sort of the greatest capacity for human beings. Because yeah, you could say it's love, but love is actually innate. But forgiveness takes true, true effort. And when we get there, then the love comes pouring in, you know? And so the getting, living in this space, being in a space with my mother, you know, and on the, just that, that, that last day, mo almost everyone come and said their goodbyes and, and they moved my mother into palliative care and it was just me and my my two brothers and I, and we they brought us in a, a bed. I don't even know if we slept that night. We might have taken turns, but we just sat there and we like played guitar and sang her songs and made fun of her and teased her and <laughs> told jokes. And yeah, it was really beautiful. It was really beautiful. Now, do you know? And, uh, and oh, I'm sorry. Go, go on. Go on. I have a, I, there's a slight lag. So listeners, please forgive me if I'm cutting you off, Matthew. What were you going to say? Finish that. Uh, yeah. I was just kind of, you know, and I think I was kind of passing that on and sharing that in part because we talk about this and we hear this so often that when people get to the end of their lives, all those things that they thought were so important, important aren't the grudges, the anger, the, the holding on to what other people think of me, all that stuff. And there's actually something like that that we don't actually have to wait until we're dead or someone close to us dies. We will, you know, generally, like we generally like to be in a lot of pain before we finally learn our lessons. So in some ways we do have to, but in other ways, the, those who come before us, those who pass away before us have something to teach us. And if we can really pull in that lesson, if we can really pull that in, we get to live such, such fuller lives without having to wait until your mom dies or my mom dies or until I'm on my deathbed or I'm faced with terminal cancer, you know? And so, yeah. Yeah. Now at that point, how old was your mom when she was, when she passed? Oh, seven and a half years ago. She would have been 72. So I guess she was 65. Yeah. 65. Okay. And then yeah. how? Do you, how? so many of us struggle with forgiveness because we've been hurt so bad or so deeply. Mm -hmm. Is it something she did between her and God alone? Or did she share with you how she finally let it go? Like, how can our listeners let that go in our lives so mm. we don't get eaten up from the inside out? Well, I think one of the things that is, can often get missed is that, is that there's some sort of trick or if I learn something that I can figure this out. And, and I don't think there is, I think, you know, we actually do need to go through life. We need to have our experiences. So we do need to suffer on our own as much as I, that's too bad. We just do. And, and we know we do because we all do. <laughs> so if we do it, it must be the way it, it is, you know, but one of the things was that that summer before she passed away, my brothers and I sat down with her and we had kind of been coddling her, particularly around my father and his, and his, and his, and his new wife was we had sort of like jumped on the bandwagon of she was aggrieved and therefore she needed pity and she needed defending and, and she needed us to come to her aid or whatever. And, 
And we were kind of hurting our lives in order to maintain her own, her, like her, her grudge, her grievance. We were enabling her, we were enabling her sort of bad behavior as it were. And did she have a right to be angry? Absolutely. But it wasn't helping her. It wasn't helping anyone around her. And so we finally said, I was like, I am done playing this game. I, you are my parent. You are not my child. I am not treating you like one anymore. I'm doing things for the family now because for years it would be, we do something with my dad, do something for my mom, kind of, you know, move on all these chess pieces, making my family, my life crazy to try and basically placate my mother's like uh, grudge or her grievance or whatever it was or her pain. Fair enough. It was pain. But at a certain point, it's like, so people make mistakes and you we, you gotta, you, and it's not helping you, right? Like you holding on to this, it's not helping you. It's hurting us, your children. It's hurting you. It's the one thing, like my mother, as I'd mentioned, she had gone from a life that was really far from enviable to a life that was truly profound and beautiful. And she had, you know, she had joined Food Addicts Anonymous and she was doing Marianne Williamson's A Course in Miracles and as like a study group. And it was just really beautiful work she was doing. And it was really wonderful. And, but we were enabling her to hold on to this last piece that wasn't serving her. So we're like, I'm done with that. And, and it was funny because she said at that point, she's like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll forgive your, your father, but I will not, I'm not ready to forgive his wife. I was like, you know what? We'll start with that. But we were pretty adamant about it. And that whole thing changed. And even during that visit, she invited her friend over, like one of her best friends, to basically try and tell me to like support my mother still or that she was perfectly justified in where she was at or whatever. And so her friend comes over and we're having this conversation and then things, and then my mom brings it up or her friend brings it up and things start getting a little heated. And then my mom leaves the room basically being like, here, friend, you deal with my son and tell him. And I was like, I start arguing with her. I'm like, and then... I find out that this is the setup when my mom has brought this person in here to try and convince me. I'm like, no, like, mom, get your butt back in here. This is not how this is going down. I get that you're in pain. I get it. Like, that's fine. But you're being angry is not healing your pain. You know, is this grudges that we hold on to other people. Somehow it can be cathartic in a certain sense, but certainly not healing nor beneficial. It basically, it's like it, it triggers something in me. And if we go back to, you know, the way our neurology works, we actually can get addicted to certain neurochemistry. And so if we have in our childhood, particularly stress or, or, or pain hormones that are released in our brain, we can actually get addicted to those. In the same way we can also get addicted to to different endorphins or why people love why people might be sort of serial daters because i always want that feeling of new whatever or people like jumping out of airplanes or whatever like those things are fun i love doing all that stuff but um but it can also be addictive and you can be as addicted to jumping out of an airplane or as you can be addicted to having consternation and conflict in your life because that's it's 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 reactivating these neurochemicals that that are familiar and therefore comforting even though it's miserable and I was like I'm done with that mom and so kind of coming all the way back to answer your question that process started and then I can't tell you for sure my mother never said hey I've let everything go but the feeling in that room during her last three days of life were like, it was like the angels were there. It was God was there. It was, it was my, my mother had, she had done what she had come for. And she had like, and I got the sense too, that she realized that she knew she was going and she knew she was dying before we did because she lost the ability to speak. And even though my brother was there during all the doctor's visits, she knew. And my brother said afterwards, oh, like she knew four days before we did. Two days later, she died. So it wasn't that, it wasn't this 
big thing, but, but she knew. And my brother's like, oh, she got it. And I believe it was also in that moment she, where she's just like, I have these grandchildren who I love. I've got these amazing friends. I have this amazing life. I've got these amazing children. And yet I've given my energy to being angry at people. And that same energy I could have put into the love I have for my children, my grandchildren, my community, you know, everything, my family, the world, love, God, everything. Why in the world am I putting it into this other place? And you just felt it in the room and it made walk into that room such that three days of being in a room or two and a half days being in a room with with my dying mother were the most profound days of my life but she couldn't tell me that with her words you know yeah so the actual process like you know what happened and why and the result it brought but you don't technically know the how she did it but that's okay because acknowledging that it's there and acknowledging why waste that time like why waste this time in our lives but it's not that easy like i that's something i struggle with and people all around the world struggle with is you forgive but how do you forget and just really let it go forever so that's cool that you know it's not how you start it's how you finish and your mom finished strong right so that's fantastic you guys get to have that beautiful experience one more totally. thing too, you, she died of lung cancer. So that's yep. kind of right. Was she a smoker or does she? She was not. Her mother was a smoker. Her mother died of lung cancer. So she grew up, but my mother was, to her, smoking was the biggest no-no in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it was a little bit ironic that she died of lung cancer. Yeah, yeah. Because that's what I was wondering, because you never mentioned that earlier. And then no. lung cancer, you know, there's all different causes, but sometimes it just happens i know a kid right now 23 years old healthy as a horse got scholarship to play baseball in college never smoked never dipped never doesn't drink i mean he's clean as can be he got tongue cancer and they had to remove like the majority of his tongue and it's just how it happens sometimes so yeah all right well matthew so we got you're born the first few years were forming with like your grandmother and then your mother and your father, and then you kind of talked about your childhood a little bit. You got two brothers, and then we jumped ahead to your parents. What mm-hmm. happened in between that's significant? What did Matthew have to face and overcome to learn and grow from that our audience can too? Well, when you get to be 44 years old, you have, you know, the challenges, they are many. <laughs> You know, and, and so it's almost hard to know as kind of where, you know, where to start. When I was 15 years old, it was right after I turned, it was the summer after ninth grade. And as I mentioned, you know, when I, in a good part of eighth grade, I lived in Mexico. Then we moved back, came to a new school in ninth grade. And afterwards, I thought, you know what, I was really, I just had this feeling, I, I've got to leave the country again. I want to do an exchange semester. And uh, I, I came from a fairly poor family. And my mother just laughed and said, you better go get a job. And that's exactly what I did. I went and I got a job and uh, saved up enough money. And through personal connections, I was able to go and spend the semester living in Germany. And uh, I remember when I arrived in my first Couple, my first week there, my host, so I lived in the castle, by the way, which was kind of cool. And the, you know, the, the, the floors were, were flagstone floors. And my host mother was pulling a milk container out of the fridge and it was in a glass container. It slipped out of her hand and it shattered and milk spilled all over the floor and it was flagstone floor. So cleaning wasn't, it's, this, these weren't modern, it was not a modern kitchen, <laughs> you know? It's like it goes everywhere and it gets in the cracks between the, you know, the, the stones and everything. And I just expected this, you know, a, you know, a, a reaction of anger. And my whole body seized up and tensed. And uh, she said, oh my, look at the beautiful milk. And 
she might as well have slapped me on the face with that. I was shocked, you know, did not see that coming. And I was like, oh my God, like there's a, there's another way to react to something bad happening. <laughs> and I was like, oh, like, let me help you clean it up. And she's like, no, 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 I've got it. And I immediately went into my room. I grabbed my journal and I flipped it over and I wrote on the back and I wrote parenting journal. And I started from the back moving towards the front. And I just started writing about things that I wanted to do as a parent. Things that I didn't want to do, things that I loved that my parents did, things that I wish that they hadn't done. One of the things that I was going to do was not, you know, curse or get angry when bad things happen. Now, Lord knows that I have failed mostly in my life at, at emulating my host mother on a regular basis, <laughs> but at least I had that as a foundation to work, work with and work towards. And so that was the age of 15. Uh, at the age of 17, I was hitchhiking around Europe that summer, and I was on the island of Iona in the Western Hebrides in Scotland. And I was just this magical place. And I said, you know what? I'm going to have a daughter soon, and I'm, I'm going to name her Iona. And sure enough, two years after that, I was back on the island of Iona and with, my, with my then girlfriend, later wife, now ex-wife. And there we conceived my first daughter, Iona. So, you know, in my biography, there was, you know, there was, there was always something in my biography of, I'm not necessarily here to go the easy way. I had a full scholarship to Oberlin College, by the way. I graduated, I'd graduated top in my class. I had a the president's scholarship. I had all this stuff. It was like, basically you could go to Oberlin college for free. Instead, I decided not to go and I was going to have a baby and continued making music at that point. And a year later, uh, I found a way to take my acapella group and my, and my wife and my daughter. And we went and toured Europe and got a grant and, and then rented a place in Northern Germany where we used our grant money to rent a couple of rooms and a, in a studio space and made music. And, and during that time, my wife got pregnant with twins and I came back to the States and I was like, well, I had twins and I was 22 years old with three kids and uh, just decided that if, if I don't go to college now, I never will. And fortunately I was in the state of Vermont, which had a lot of social programs that made it possible for me to work nights and go to school during the day. And, you know, be, you know, really be there for my kids on the weekends and, and, you know, in between break times. And I, you know, my, my college career was going to school, going to work and the restaurants coming home late at night, cleaning the kitchen. <laughs> then the twins would wake up and walk them back to sleep, you know, put them down, wake up at seven in the morning, you know, take the bus to, to to college, do that, you know, hitchhike back to work because the bus schedule didn't work with when I needed to be at work and when my last class was over. So I'd hitchhike back into town, you know, work, you know, and then get, make sure that I was caught up during the week. That way my weekends were basically free to be with the kids. And so, you know, that, you know, I was talking about, you know, struggle, there was, you know, there was that and, um, you know, and, you know, my, my ex and I, we got together really young. I mean, we had our, we were, she was 13. I was 14 the first time we had a role in the hay. And, uh, you know, throughout high school, we weren't really together. We didn't really get together until our senior year. But, but from the very beginning, when we first met in ninth grade, there was, there was, you know, there was this attraction and it was profound you know the it was profound and it was challenging and those challenges were at times disheartening but they were also pretty phenomenal you know the person that i had to become the growth that i had to go through to 
you know, basically where, you know, my, my, like I said, my teenage years were so profound in like, I, yeah, I lived in Mexico and in Germany. And in those years, I hitchhiked tens of thousands of miles around Latin America, the United States, Europe. I went to these international youth conferences all over the world. I had this incredible time of finding myself and speaking new languages and kind of blowing my mind with this, with, with learning how other languages sort of expand your way of seeing different things. It was, it was incredible. And now all of a sudden I'm confronted with, I don't really know myself. I'm in a marriage before I could know who I was. I was a father before I could know who I was. I was a father of three, <laughs> just as I was, you know, getting the the very first touches of being able to understand who I was. Meanwhile, I have somebody else who's so, so different from me, basically, you know, kind of tempering me as it were, you know? So my, you know, we were together for nearly 20 years and, you know, I feel like during those times I became like a, a, uh, you know, a ninja sword of being, you know, 200 folds or whatever they say, you know, it's just like, you know, the hammer and the anvil. And there I am, this like piece of metal just getting hammered between the anvil and the hammer. But, you know, the forging of what that took and something that really sort of culminated in my, in my mid thirties with, where with really with, you know, there was a series of, of lessons that came that I had been gathering over my lifetime and paying attention and the lessons were finally, I finally sort of had the maturity and the, the breadth of experiences and, and really the knowledge to, to now kind of put those pieces together. And in many ways culminated with the death of my mother, which was sort of the, this kind of like final piece of my youth. I was 30 was I 36 when my mother died? I think I was 36 when my mother died. And that was kind of like this emphatic end to my youth because I really was young in so many ways for so long. And with that stamp, it was like, oh, I, I just, I grew up so much and all of that forging and all of those challenges brought me into this place where I didn't, I, like every challenge, every difficulty finally became clear what it was there for. And, you know, and, and it was, it was, I feel like in some ways it really came, you know, there was probably between thir ages of 33 or 34 to, to 36. Those things were becoming really, really clear, but that was this final thing of, every difficult thing or quote unquote bad thing that's ever happened to me, at some point I could look back and I had enough distance from it or separation from it that I could look back and say, oh, now I see why that happened. And it was at that moment where I said, you know what? There are times where I can't see why it happened in the moment, but I know 100% of the time, every time, because I'm a curious person and I pay attention, at some point, I'll get to the point where I can say, oh, now I see why that happened. Yeah, there's a and, verse in the Bible that says all things work together for good to those that love God, to those that are call, called according to his purpose. And even when we're in our deepest, darkest days, seasons, even months, years, it yeah. all works out for God's glory for pursuing him. Exactly. That's exactly right. And that's, that is so easy to lose sight of when things are challenging. <clears throat> but <laughs> when you've lived long enough and you see that that's happened every time, then you can also say, you know what? Oh, I just made this huge mistake. I just made a $10,000 mistake or I made a, you know, I, I, I can't believe I did that. I, I swerved and I hit the, you know, and I, I hit this other car because I thought to avoid hitting a squirrel or whatever, you know, like, you know, there are all these all these things you say, oh man, why did I do that? And it's just, you know what? At some point, it's gonna become really clear why that happened. So why don't I just 
in, instead of like beating up on myself or hating myself or being angry at myself for that mistake, say, you know what? I'm going to immediately get curious to find figure out why did that happen? Not, oh, why did that happen? But why did that happen? And just that intonation, like then that was what happened during those period of times. So if I change my intonation with this question, why is this happening to me or why did that happen to me? Then I will be a happy person. And so, you know, so I, 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 I strayed a little bit from, from that initial kind of your initial question, but you know, that those, there were so many experiences in my life that were deeply, deeply challenging. And yet at the same time, those challenges are, you know, were vital. They were totally vital. Each and every one from the things that other people did to me that felt where I felt wronged to the times where I just did, did something knuckleheaded or the times where I was actually, you know, where I hurt someone else, you know? So, yeah. And um, then one thing is you skipped. You yeah. said how you had a choice between going to college for music and then you moved. But talk about quickly your passion for music and how that ties into today. Got it. Well, you know, my passion for music was almost accidental. I, and I think my passion for music was actually a little bit more in my passion for performance because I'm not a good musician. At some point I've been thinking about remastering my first, my first CD um, and, and kind of re-releasing it and putting it up on SoundCloud or, or Spotify or something. I, I wasn't that great. I was never a very good singer. I was a, I was a knock and bugger. Well, not a great singer, not a great musician. There was this period of my life where I was writing songs and I don't know how I was doing it, but I was writing songs that really resonated with people such that I was invited to go perform all over the US and Europe and was able to make a, a living for a year touring Europe and getting a grant for my music and all this stuff. So, so, it was, in some ways, it was, it was like, it was just part of the thing that pulled me maybe, a, you know, away from going to, maybe away from going to college into being exactly where I needed to be for when I, my first daughter was born for, you know, and my ex and I had been pretty much broken up right before, you know, before she got pregnant with the twins. We were like, you know what, we're 21 years old or something. What are we doing? We're we're not happy together. This isn't working out. Why should we just make each other miserable? And, and, but we were still, you know, committed to co-parenting and, and uh, we had actually, we were living in this, in this big community and uh, it was a, it was an old converted train station in Germany and, and I had moved out into another room, but we were still co-parenting. And so we still had a daughter together and we were very committed to that. And during that period of time, she got pregnant with, with, with the twins. And, you know, it was so like, you know, it was so magical in so many ways. I mean, my twins are these amazing children. And, you know, and when I look at, okay, you know, we're, you know, and the music is what brought us there. And these twins needed to be in my life. They were there, you know, and, you know, I'm sure though, you probably have listeners sometimes too, who think, you know what, man, like sometimes marriage just gets really, really hard. And we, we live in a world where we have a choice. Do we stay or do we not stay? And there are consequences to those, to those choices. And and one of the things that a mentor of mine shared with me when I was going through a really difficult period of time in, 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 in my first marriage was she was like, you, you, you can't leave angry. Don't leave, you can't leave angry and you can't leave for someone else. So since you're angry, you can't leave yet. You have to go, you have to make sure that you've had the best year or two of your life. And if you still wanna go, or not the best year or two of your life, best year or two of your marriage, and if it's still not right, then you'll know you're doing it out of freedom and you're not being controlled by your anger. <clears throat> and 
but one of one of these like huge lessons was that I actually needed to to heal the part of me that that was so hard that was making that my marriage difficult. And so I know you're going to ask about this music, but it's something that the the it's something that when I kind of see it was just it was a, it was a flash in the pan, but it served its purpose. You know, it served its purpose to get me into these places to bring certain challenges into my life, to bring certain joys into my life, to keep certain passion alive in my life. So it was this very brief thing that happened for just for a few years. And I moved back when we, when that, our year in Europe was over, we came back. My ex was, was pregnant with the twins. And I thought life of a traveling musician isn't going to work with this many kids. We could barely do it with one, but doing it with three, not going to happen. And that's where I kind of, you know, then switched my focus into, into filmmaking. And that was really what became my, my career after that. And now what was it that you were struggling with? that was making you angry in the marriage. And then how did you overcome it? Cause I know we have mm -hmm. listeners all over the world who are struggling with anger and frustration in marriage. So what yeah. did you specifically face and how did you get through it? Got it, man. That's such a huge question. That's, that's podcast. That's, that's podcasts worth to me. It's one of my favorite sort of stories of my life in part because it was so difficult, but also because it was so rewarding for me, you know, personally for the growth that I had to go through for the, for what I was able to, you know, where I was able to go with it. And also because actually, even at the end of that, I, I knew actually that it became a true choice because at the end I was like, you know what? I can, I could do this for the rest of my life. I could do this, but I also know that it's not actually what's right. It was just so, there was so, so much clarity, but like, I still love my ex, you know, she's, you know, she's a great human being. And so that's, it's not like I don't love her anymore. And even at the time when that came, it was like, you know, our needs as individuals are so much different that for us to stay together, the, the tragedy is that one of us has to make huge sacrifices to what is our sort of our, our core importance in life or what, what we truly feel we need. And therefore it's actually just not fair. You know, I, I, I'm going to go do my thing and the love can still, we, I can still have an enormous amount of love for you. And, you know, and in your difficulties, I can have an enormous amount of compassion for you, but I don't have to own it. I don't have to take it on. And I don't have to basic, I don't have to, you know, the depth of the, the depth of my sacrifice gets to sort of end here with that. Now the process, some of that was, I need to know who I am and I need to basically be confident. And I guess that's one of the big things that I realized was we did fight quite a bit. And at one point I remember my oldest daughter said to me, she said, you know, Pa, like you're, it's, if you're the, you're, it's, it's within your power to stop fighting. You know, she basically was like, came to like, I don't believe it's in my mother's power to stop fighting, but it's within your power. So you have to do it. And she kind of shared this with me in a moment where I was realized I do have that power and I could stop being triggered, you know? And I was like, oh, I could actually work. And it was, you know, someone said, I believe that you cannot be triggered. And I was able to live into that belief of that person who I cared for. And and then it also became this thing where I, and I've seen this so often when, when people get in arguments is that if there's a, people will stop arguing with you. If there's, if they know there's no chance of like, of changing your mind, you know, it's like when I'm certain about something, people don't fight with me now getting to that certainty. And how do you get there in a way where you also need to be malleable and open, particularly in a marriage, right? In a marriage, it's not a one way street. We need to be able to move back and forth and, and compromise is this beautiful thing in marriage. You know, 
compromise sometimes can be like, oh, it's this dirty word. It's this negative thing. But no, compromise is beautiful because compromise means I'm going to do something I wouldn't have otherwise done. So I am, I'm this, I, it's clear what I'm going to do in the way that I do things. And someone comes along and says, no, we're not doing it that way. We're doing this way. And I'm like, well, no, I'm compromising this thing. that's important to me. And at, for a long time, like I resisted compromise. And then I realized, wow, I'm living this life I would never live otherwise. I get to experience new things. And that was beautiful. But if I wasn't also clear that I was making a choice to do that, right? So the difference was not, am I going to compromise this, but am I going to choose this? And, and I mentioned before this, this, this mentor of mine who said to make, make sure you have the best year or two of your marriage if you're going to leave. I decided I was never going to to, how do I want to say, I never want to, I'm never going to give up what I, I'm never going to be like, okay, fine, I'll do it that way. Every time I went to do something that was not my first choice, I would make the choice to choose that instead. So I want, you know, Chinese food and she wants Mexican food. I'm like, oh, fine, we'll go have Mexican food, Right. That would have been in my 20s, that was it. You know what? I keep doing the things that you want to do. I'm not doing what I want to do. And now I can hold a grudge or I can hold resentment because I wanted Chinese and you wanted Mexican. And I keep compromising doing Mexican when I want Chinese. And therefore, things never go my way. And all I do is I spend my life doing things your way and not my way. And now I don't even know who I am anymore. I'm not happy anymore. Then I got to a point where I said, you know what? I wanted Chinese food and you want Mexican food. There's only one way I'm going to do Mexican food. And that is if I choose to do it, right? So now I can say, rather than being like, I'm compromising, I'm going to do it this way. It's like, you know what? I'm now choosing it. So now if in five days from now, I'm like, you know what? I want Chinese food. And you're like, you want Mexican food again. It's not like, well, last time I compromised and did it your way. This time you compromise and do it my way. I don't have bring any of that stank, any of that scorekeeping, any of that grudge. We talked about grudges earlier. I'm not bringing any of that into it. Instead, I get to say, you know what? No, this time I'm having Chinese food. Well, I really want Mexican food. Well, if you really want Mexican food, you should by all means have Mexican food. But I'm going to have Chinese food. So we can either stop by and pick up Chinese on the way, or we can go pick up Mexican food on the way and however we're going to do it. But this is now important to me. And I don't have any attitude about it. I'm not holding any grudges. So if I don't have any attitude about it, she doesn't have to have any attitude about it. And now we actually get to have harmony, <laughs> right? And so it's basically choosing, constantly choosing. And, and that was like this magical understanding for, for me to come to. And I don't, my compromises aren't really compromises anymore. It's that somebody else, it's my, you know, it's my, my partner, whoever that happens to be, whoever I'm dealing with. And this is also sometimes with my kids or with friends or whatever. I'm not going to begrudgingly be like, okay, fine, we'll do it your way. If there's something that's really important to me, I state it. And it doesn't mean that I won't do the other, but I'm going to choose the other way. I'm not going to compromise into the other way. Yeah. And I do actually, I do want to talk about that because what you're describing is like a paradigm shift or a mental choice. Mm -hmm. And you said, you know, you don't want to hold on to bitterness and, you know, keep score. That would be a compromise and negotiates where you talk through it and you both come to mutual terms. So you found a very unique and healthy way where you're not compromising like, I don't feel like compromise is the right word because you're not compromising or holding that bitterness and grudge and you're not having to go yeah. through a full-blown three-hour negotiation over what to have for dinner, but you're making a mental switch. You're almost like, I don't want to say talking yourself through it, but that's what you're saying if I'm hearing you correctly, right? Yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, like, and, and even, you know, during that period of time where I was saying I had the best like year and a half of my marriage was I could say, you know what? That's not my first choice. I would rather do it the other way. But, you know, just so that I'm just so that we're clear, that's not really my first choice, but I am going to choose it. You know, and early on it was a little bit more like, excuse me, I, 
yeah, it wasn't even really just kind of a just just to name it. You know, I need to be clear that it's not my first choice, but I'm still go by doing it. I'm not compromising into I'm choosing into it as a second choice. And everyone has a plan B. That's totally fine. You know, there's nothing wrong. We and you know, at the end of the day, most of the things don't matter. But at a certain point in life, those things might add up and you say, you know what? And really kind of one of the big shifts came was in order to maintain peace, I'm, I'm, my life is now becoming about my second choices always. And that's not a, a way I felt that I could truly thrive. My thriving was going to be able to be really in flow. And that was when it was just, okay, this is, it's, it's time to move on. But it wasn't for lack of real effort. And the amazing thing was, is that if I look back, and this is since you talked about challenges, and then we get to move on to more fun things, I guess, than, you know, my, my, my former marriage. But the, the amazing thing is that because I, I did so much of the healing then, I didn't have to bring that same crap with me, you know? And so often, you know, there's this saying, right? Wherever you go, there you are. You, we take our stuff with us until we heal it. And if we don't heal it, it comes with us because the difficulties in my, in my first marriage were, were not like because of her, you know? It was, and it wasn't necessarily because of me, but a lot of it was because of me. And I could say a lot of it was because of her, but that doesn't help me at all. Like, what did I do and how did I react when she did this? You know, could I be, could I have been like a Kung Fu, ma could I have been like a, you know, Aikido master deflecting stuff? And that's ultimately where it came to. It was like, you know what? I don't need to, I don't need to fight, you know, and it's not to say that I, that I have a conflict-free, you know, relationship at this point, because that would be not true because there is conflict. I think that's part of life, but the Two humans of, living of, together will always have conflict at some point. There's, it's going to happen. I'd like to say that it, it, you know, she used to, my fiance used to joke with me. She'd say, you know, she called me the prophet of doom because I was like, well, you know what, this, this honeymoon feeling that we have, it, it ain't going to last forever. Like I know that. And I don't want to pretend like it will, will here we are like, you know, going on five years in, into our, our relationship and it still pretty much feels like the honeymoon phase. And so I have to say, you know, you know what? This takes effort. <laughs> we we have to work on it. We and we do. We we definitely put in a lot of effort, uh, and it's not always it's not always fun in games necessarily. But but I but that the that that eros love that passion crazily enough is still there. But I say crazily enough because just because like even in like in whether it's sort of books on relationship psychology I've read, or even if it's how neuro our neurology works and the way our, our hormones work and the way that, you know, that, that those things shift within us, I'm not supposed to feel this way five years into a relationship, and I do. But that does come from a certain amount of, yeah, there's, there's effort that, that goes into it, but it's also the work that you know, that, 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 that my fiance and I have done both together, but also individually coming into this. So therefore we have this amazing foundation that we can, that we can work from. And I just say that because, you know, when we talk about this where there's no sort of like shying away from the reality that, that the past, that the pasts that we had deeply inform the human being is that we have become. And therefore, the past that we had were also beautiful and we really honor those pasts. And we're grateful for our, for everything that, that we each had separately because that's, it's given us, you know, it's given us so much. So yeah, there was a lot of this healing, you know, the, this healing and and I think that that can sometimes take time. And I, and I, I always like to sort of be a little careful in when I talk about this, because, you know, Sarah and I, we do have a relationship podcast called the interracial couple podcast. And, you know, is that, you know, the effort and the work is so vital, but there are definitely times when, you know, there are people who are abusive. 
There are people who are abusive in different ways. There are different ways of being abusive. There are deeply, deeply unhealthy relationships, and those can be healed. And there are also times when those can't be healed. You know, one person can definitely do the work. It doesn't take two people to do the work. But at a certain point, you know, if only one person is doing the work, and you know, there may get come to that point where it just it it just doesn't it it doesn't suffice anymore. And so I just like to sort of put a caveat because I feel like I remember going through this period of time where I felt like I was a deep failure because I wasn't able to, because I was like, this, this, this marriage is, is over. And I felt like a failure and it took me. And, and even like afterwards, I was like, I was disappointed, even though I worked so hard and I did so much for it. And it was, and it was one of the most, it's one of the most beautiful things in the world. But I also had to, you know, it, it was, you know, allow it to be what it was going to be and not try and force something that just wasn't going, that, that didn't serve anyone anymore. You know, like life is just so long now and, and we do grow and, 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 you know, and just to sort of like actually really respect that we're here on this planet for something that is that has a purpose far beyond our comprehension or our capabilities to, to fully recognize or realize. So it's to come into it with curiosity and oftentimes sort of without judgment and, and around marriage and relationships, there can easily be so much judgment. And that kind of, that, that's a bummer, you know, that, that we put so much judgment on ourselves as opposed to, I think when we can let some of the judgment go, then we can also actually say, you know what? Also, when I like made a big mistake or if I screwed something up or whatever it was, that I'm not bad because of that. You know, I'm not, I'm not wicked. I'm not all these other things. I'm, I'm a human being and, and like Jesus made mistakes, <laughs> you know, like Jesus had to be tempted. Jesus had like all of these things, you know, it's like, you know, these are, this is part of being on the planet, you know? We are all children of God and, and, you know, God, you know, you kind of look at it in several ways, like either God doesn't make mistakes or then therefore what happens here is perfectly okay. Or God does make mistakes. And if God makes mistakes, then we're allowed to do. And by that, I mean that, you know, I mean, we can, it's, it can all be semantics, but, you know, but I do, you know, as a, as a, as a filmmaker and as a writer, and I also, I, I, I consult and coach with people. I say, you know, when you're creating something, we want it to be perfect, but like God made this amazing planet. And yet people like children die young and there's terrible diseases. And, and if that's, if the world doesn't go perfectly according to plan all the time, or things don't seem perfect, well, if, God doesn't do it perfectly without diseases or without oil spills or, you know, without malaria and hundreds of thousands of children dying every year in sub-Saharan Africa from, you know, from communicable diseases. Like, you're probably not going to make a, like, write a perfect script either. <laughs> so, so let that be okay. Forgive yourself. Honor yeah, I, yourself. Honor. I you agree know? with what you're saying in the, the concept. I just have a different perspective on it. So what you're saying with is, are we going to make mistakes? Yes. Are we going to consciously make horrible choices and sin? Yes. I personally believe God is perfect. I believe that he doesn't sin or make mistakes. But I, I think this is the only difference in what we're saying is I believe he gives us free will as men, mankind. Yeah. And we choose to be selfish and we choose to be corrupt. And then you have other things, like you said, some things just happen. Like, <clears throat> why would a child be born with an illness? Why would a right. disease overrun the earth? And that goes deep into a theological conversation where God doesn't cause any evil, but sometimes he allows it. So for instance, we made choice from the garden of Eden to sin against God, disobey. <clears throat> and now we have consequences of it as mankind as a whole. But the good news yeah. is when this life is over, eternity is perfect if you're with heaven. So that's the good news. So I think we're saying the same exact thing just have a different frame of reference and we can, you know, yeah. And I, and, 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 and I'm actually with you there. Cause I, 
because if you look at it that way too, I also don't actually think that we make mistakes. We might err. We may sin. We may, we can put any word on that that we want to, but the reality is, is that as soon as we have done something, as soon as the action has happened, it was, there is actually benefit in the world for that action because we get to grow, we get to grow from it. And when I say that, I always have to be careful because, you know, because then we can, you can also, you know, use that to sort of excuse torture or, or rape or murder or whatever. So it's not that with others, it's within ourselves. As soon as I've done something, I can say that was meant to be. Now it may be my, my task to figure out why did I have to do that quote unquote knuckleheaded thing? And now I get to figure that out. So I actually don't actually even believe there's a mistake. So when I, when I kind of bring these things up and, and hearing what you just said too, is the semantics around it. And I think this is actually one of my favorite things. We haven't really gotten much into a theological conversation yet, but, but, but that the, I had a, I had a, a spiritual teacher once who said, if you're going to do spiritual research as it were, you have to get really comfortable with paradox and ambiguity because there is so much that, you know, in some of the deepest truths, our, our logical human, you know, pea brains can't actually comprehend the vastness and the vastness actually can contain two things that might seem diametrically opposed or totally opposite that are actually so deeply related. And that's sort of this, you know, this grand view from the sort of the God's eye view, as it were, of we don't necessarily understand how, you know, how two things can exist contradictory simultaneously at the same time. And part of the beauty of that is that, is that we actually can't, we can't, we're just, you know, and even sometimes I feel like the, the hubris of that is, is almost like it's, it can be problematic you know, and it's because what I just, in, in my, in my own sort of relationship with spirituality and religion and God and scripture, it's like, I'm, I'm open to a lot of possibility because I just, I, I, I don't think that I'm fully capable of understanding. And if I did, I would basically be thinking I'm a little closer to God than God would think, you know, God'd be like, yeah, you know, get back in your place you know, you're a mere mortal. So there's this, this sort of this vast, this vastness that, that I can, I love striving towards. And, and I think it kind of hit me in some ways, sometime in my early to mid thirties, when, you know, it was my mid thirties, I guess. And, and I remember calling my father because I just had this, and I wanted to share with him because my father is, his relationship with 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 Christianity is is quite deep and profound and quite different from mine and he finds a certainty in a lot of ways in the way that his, that his relationship is and i remember calling him up and being like i i feel so free in my relationship to god and spirituality because i realize that I'm actually wrong about everything that I believe. And that might be a slightly wrong, like a slightly definitive way of putting it. Perhaps a more accurate way, which also might have elicited less of a pushback from him, would have been, I am not right about anything. <laughs> In that and I, I'm wrong because I can't be right because I can't see the whole picture because I'm not God. So therefore, what I see is what's been revealed to me until now, up until this moment. And, and so, and, and, and this kind of, this piece came to me, which was that every few years I would, I would evolve into, oh, like now I know. I was confused. I thought I knew, but now I know. And then I kept coming up to this thing where then I would have, I would, I would have read something or had this a deep belief about, you know, something within my religious slash spiritual development. And then 
it would shift and it wouldn't be like totally contradictory, right? But it'd be like, wait, no, that wasn't quite right either. And this is, and, and as I grew, I realized, well, if I'm 34 now, and when I was 30, I was dang sure about this. And when I was 24, I was dang sure about that. And when I was 18, I was dang sure about that. That basically means that when I'm 44, 54, 64, 74, 84, 94, that'll keep happening. And I want to come, you know, and so if I know that, that means that I can step into all that I quote unquote know, or I believe, or I perceive, I can hold that all with a sense of wonder and curiosity, knowing that I'm just scratching the surface and I'm going to keep scratching it and I'm going to keep going. And it's not fruitless, but I'm never going to get there and that's okay. I'm just going to get a little bit closer each time with also the humility to know that the closer I get to God, as it were, the closer I get to enlightenment or whatever, however we, you want to name that, the closer that I get to it, I'm, I'm still always going to be ridiculously far away and that's okay. Yeah. And I think that's scripturally supported because the closer we get to God, the more we realize how far away we are. And until eternity, when we're with him, we're not going to understand everything, but it is a growth journey. Like you said, every 10 years, it seems like you learn something new or get sharper. We're just refining and growing and we just have more of a love and appreciation towards God. And I was laughing earlier. I think I was off camera because it switches back and forth, but you know, there's David and Joseph in the Bible two men God love, but such different stories. You got David who screwed everything up and did everything wrong. And he was a man after God's heart and he continued to learn and grow. And then you had Joseph who had everything it seemed to go wrong to him and he didn't really do anything wrong. And it was years, not just days or months, but years. But then at the end, he didn't understand like, why is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is this happening? But at the end he looks back and he's like, I can see everything God allowed but the reason why. So yeah, for all our mm -hmm. listeners out there, we don't know a lot of time what's going on. And a lot of times we don't want to wait and be patient. We need to do and act and live, but we can't control everything. And that's a big lesson I have to learn over and over again. I can't control everything. I just need to yeah. roll with it. Kind of like your father. You said, yeah. whatever <laughs> happens, he just rolls with it, right? Yeah, Some of amazing. us have more of a problem than others. So yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks for sharing so much, Matthew. So take us, you have a wife and three kids. You get, you get to the point where you're like, okay, it's time for us to separate and get a divorce. And then you mentioned mm -hmm. many times your new fiance, bridge us that gap and transition us into where you are today. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, uh, well, there was after so I have, I have three biological children and then one who I acquired as a, as a very early teen around, she was around 12 or 13. And uh, she didn't really have a father in her life. And, uh, and I offered to be that. So I have, I have a fourth and, and then so she was, you know, yeah, she, she was actually living with me for just up just until last month, actually, when we came back from Kenya and then she moved out, went traveling and came back in COVID and also couldn't find a place to live. So she lived with us for a while and finally moved into her own place. So I've got, I have four adult grown daughters. My youngest children are 21 and the oldest is pushing 24. Yeah. I just turned 44. So She's right on my heels. So I, I had been uh, divorced for well, two or three years. I forget exactly. We didn't, you know, the, it was a slow separation because I was in no rush when I knew what needed to be. I was like, we'll just like, let take our time. And, and, you know, it wasn't like, oh my God, I need to get out of here or whatever. It was this sense of, it was such a place of peace that we were able to really go through a process and try and make it as, as smooth as we could for the kids and stuff who were already in high school when that, when, when that was happening. And then I had spent, you know, so I'd been, but you know, I, I had 
had basically been been single for a while, and I knew that I was ready to find a. I was ready for a partnership. I was ready for. Uh, I was ready for that, but I was also aware that the people that uh, we are attracted to as human beings uh, aren't necessarily. We're not necessarily attracted to people out of totally free will. We'd like to think that we are, but we're just not. Interestingly enough, arranged marriages have a better success rate than non-arranged marriages. Yeah, that's the, because, statistically through the years, that's always held, and now more so yes. than ever. Right when we have a choice, right in a in an era where we have a choice, and now why is that? Well, you know, when we choose somebody. We're also choosing somebody that is sort of going to represent very often certain challenges that we maybe we need, but we don't necessarily want. They may, you know, there and there are certain like, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, there are different, you know, there are patterns that we get into. And I was like, I'm going to fall into a pattern. And if I'm not really clear, I may fall in love with somebody just out of some sort of chemical reaction. And I want something greater than that. So, so I actually, I went to Death Valley uh, on my own and I went to go do some writing and I, I, you know, I rented a room and I, you know, I got in one night and I thought, you know, I'm going to sit down, I'm going to write. I got in the afternoon and I went to sit down and write and I thought, you know what? I think before I write, I just need to go on a hike. So I walked out and if, you've, if anyone's ever like near Death Valley and it's not the middle of the summer, go. It is just breathtakingly beautiful. Oh my God, it's just shocking. And I just went out and just hiked around the valley and was just so alive. And then went back and I went to sleep and I said, great, you know, I'm like, I'll get up in the morning and I'll write. And I got up the next morning and sat down at my little desk and I forget if I opened my computer or my journal or wherever it was. And I Get, I just sit there and I'm staring at blank paper. You know what? Before I write this morning, I'm going to go on a hike. And I just went and hiked for half the day and came back. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to write now. And I sat down to write and just stared at this blank page. And I was like, forget that. And I'm going to go hiking and then I'll just write tonight. And I basically spent my like two and a half days in Death Valley just hiking. But while I was hiking, <laughs> one of the things that during one of these hikes that came to me was I need to be really intentional. If, if, I'm, if I'm ready to be in a relationship, I also want to be intentional about it. What's important to me? And as I was walking, I had my iPhone and I was dictating and, and, and I had dictated thoughts and then I came back and I, and I wrote them then in my journal and was getting really clear about what was important to me. There, that way I was like, I, if I go into a relationship, I'm going in and it doesn't mean I can't let my heart speak to me, you know? But but I also need to let my brain do some of the talking as well. Because anyone who's, who's been in a relationship before knows you are also kind of in a business together. You make financial decisions, you make practical choices together. And, and I want to be someone that I, that I, that we complement each other, not where we, you know, and, and, and if we complement each other, it means we don't necessarily always agree on everything. It means we have different strengths and different weaknesses. Those can either those can either support us to be greater or those can push us each down. And so I was very intentional about it. And literally the, the next day, it was New Year's Day, and I got a text from Sarah. And now Sarah, we have mutual friends. And six months earlier about, we had briefly connected. We ran into each other. She was uh, renting a room at her, her host family. She's Kenyan, and so she was renting a room with her host family, and and they were also friends of mine. So we had these mutual friends, but we didn't really know each other, and we had chatted just a few times, very briefly. And over the summer, we had run into each other. There, I was dropping off a DVD for uh, for her host father, and she was coming back from lunch with someone. We started talking, and we thought, you know what? I was rushing out, and I said, you know what? Let's finish this conversation over coffee sometime. She said, great. So we exchanged phone numbers and. Maybe about four months later, I reached out and I was like, hey, how about, do uh, you want to grab coffee this week? And she said, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling well this week, but uh, let's get touch base soon. 
probably about four days later, I ran into her having coffee with somebody. I was like, oh, that's funny. And then, and, and then about a month later, it was New Year's Day. And she said, I got a message from her. And she said, well, why don't we grab lunch? And I was like, that's weird. I said, well, you know what? This week is like really busy for me. So uh, let, me, let me touch base with you like next week. Literally two days later, I ran into her having lunch with someone. And when we looked at each other, we both thought, this is weird. I think we're going to have to do it. And uh, so anyway, she messaged me again a little bit later maybe that afternoon or the next day, how about lunch? And I was, you know, I'm super busy this week, but I could grab drinks on Thursday evening. And it's funny because she actually knew my oldest daughter. Like they were, I don't know if they were like necessarily friends, but they knew each other. They had, you know, they had gone out and had coffee before. So, so like there was nothing between us. She's, you know, over seven years younger than I am. And, and, but so there was really, it was just like, she was someone who knew my daughter. It was just like, we're just going to go out for coffee, but then there's no time. So we went out for drinks and it was really funny because she thought, Matthew Temple does drinks. That's so weird. He's like, Iona's dad. He's so square. <laughs> but we went out and it was amazing. We just hung out and it was just so relaxed and that evening I just, I went home and I just, I couldn't sleep. And I pulled out my journal. I was like, you know what? Over that week when I was by myself in Death Valley, I had been describing this woman who I think I might've just met this woman. Like this is a pretty close description of who this person is. So uh, a few days later we hung out again and literally that was the second time we hung out and it was, you know, just when our hands touched, it was just so clear that, oh my gosh, like this is this person, you know, this is the person that, uh, that I, I, I think this is it. And yeah, so that was, that was kind of the way, the way that happened. And later I, I kind of like laughed cause I had, I was actually, <laughs> I've, I'll, I'll preface this with, I've done psychedelic mushrooms twice in my life. I'm not a, I am definitely not much of a uh, drug user. I'm certainly not opposed. I don't feel like it, it has necessarily a major place in my life, but twice I've done psychedelic mushrooms. And the first time was one, it was just a, this amazingly profound experience of kind of understanding my own biography. And this next, the, this other one, and this was after we'd been together for a couple of years, just this vision of how, like, before we were born, you know, because she's Kenyan, and her story of how she got to, to America is a crazy story. And, like, how we got to this, that moment where I was dropping off this DVD. Like, we'd been circling, we'd been around each other for several years beforehand and never really talked. And then it was as though the angels were saying, you guys, like we've been trying like here now, Matthew has to drop off this DVD just at the moment when you're coming back. And then that still didn't work. And then it was this, Hey, let's grab, finally grab this coffee. And she said, no. And then we had to run into each other having coffee. And then she's like, Hey, how about lunch? And then I was like, I don't know. I don't have time. And then we run into each other where she's having, where she's having lunch with someone. And it was just like, it was as though the angels were working overtime to make sure that we got, that we connected. And I just had, there was this sort of vision of, oh my God, like, and kind of going back to what I talked about too, of being okay with those struggles that happened in our lives earlier was everything that had to happen, even from all of the, like the amount of missed opportunities and like close calls that I had to have been a very, very successful filmmaker in Hollywood, it was like, there were these, all these near misses, you know, I, every pro movie that I produced with, with a studio or that was, that was released by a studio, I had a movie released that I produced for, for Un Columbia Pictures. I made a movie with, uh, for MTV. I did a movie for Universal. I, 
all these like movies that I did and every one that I did, there was like, they just didn't hit. It was the, you know, I, I, I sold a script and I was like, oh, I finally, now I've sold a script. I mean, it was nice. I got a check for selling a script or whatever. And, and then that didn't work out. And it was like one thing, there were all of these, these things that were so close. When I got my, my first kind of like, I don't want to say it was a big acting role, but I had a, I had a really fun scene with Josh Brolin in a movie that nobody watched. And, and even like being on set for two days with, with Josh Brolin, like that was in John Malkovich. And I was like that when, it, when you're in a summer blockbuster movie and you're in, you're on set for two days, you also get a piece of the pie. And I know people who have like, you know, you make, can make thousands of dollars for a two day role. And I was like, this is going to be great. Literally no one saw that movie. It was the first, it was the first flop that legendary pictures had total flop. And it was just like one thing after another and all of these things. And then like, Oh, cause I had to be this person in this place at this moment where I could meet Sarah. It was like every challenge that I had immediately, like as soon, and it was really as soon as we met, but also when I had that experience also was this sort of this, this, this like transcendent experience of thank God, like truly thank God for every difficulty that I've ever had for every setback, for every near miss that didn't happen for every near miss that did happen for every single thing. I am eternally grateful. There is not one thing in my life, but that was at that, that I wished had was different when I had that. But now, you know, we've been together now for a while and sort of as like kind of this funny little example, right even before Sarah and I met a, a friend of mine and I'd like, I hadn't been working for a while. Cause you know, you work in, in, in the industry as I did, you know, you've got a few years where I'm producing a lot of stuff and I'm making a ton of money. And then a few years where there's nothing going on. And then, you know, it's kind of like up and down. And I was going through a little bit of a low period and a friend of mine, financially and a friend of mine was just like, buy as much Ethereum as you possibly can. He's like, max out everything you can do it. And I was like, that's easy for you to say, like, you don't have four kids. You're not paying alimony. You're not like all this other stuff. You have no idea. I can look back and be like, man, I had an inside scoop. You know, I'd be a millionaire if I would listened to my friend. That's something that I, every once in a while I get this little like twang of, oh, like, and I knew it. I knew it, you know? And, but now I can go back and say, you know what? Thank God that didn't happen. Thank God that didn't happen. And there's a reason. And I don't necessarily, some of them I can see, but I, I need to be where I'm at right now. I need to be here so I can figure out what, you know, so that I can take the steps that I need to be. I need to be in my life, not someone else's life or not some imaginary life or not anything else. Like my life is not designed to be, you know, I'm not a lottery winner. You know, I'm, that's not part of my life. I'm not, I'm not winning the lottery in that way. It's not my life. And I know that my lottery tickets, my winning lottery tickets are the children that I have is my, my, my fiance that I have, my winning lottery ticket is, you know, we have three businesses that we're doing together right now that are, uh, that are beautiful and amazing. And we're struggling to get these things off the ground and they're beautiful. And this is what my life is for is that I'm here in service. I'm not here to buy a bunch of, you know, cryptocurrency and become a crypto millionaire. Not my life not the one. I'm not going to, you know, go speculating on, on, on stocks or whatever. Yeah. I'm sm probably smart enough to do that kind of stuff, but it also takes energy and there's only so many hours in the day. And I could be speculating with that. I could be learning about that. I could be gambling that one, or I could be spending time with my kids and writing the lover's journal that Sarah and I wrote together and writing my other book, you know, the, the, the creative's handbook and, and recording two podcasts like that makes me feel alive. So every like near miss, whether it was either something that could have been that didn't or something that almost didn't happen, but did, I'm just eternally grateful. All right. Talk, and talk about that. 
where is Matthew Temple today? You just mentioned a whole bunch, but where are you today and where are you heading? Oof, okay. So I spent the last, well, in the last two years, I spent about a year and a half of that living in Kenya. I always knew that as soon as my youngest kids graduated high school, I was going to do something that would appear from the outside like a midlife crisis move, which I was like, that's funny because it's going to kind of coincide with a midlife crisis timing. I was 41 years old. I just turned 41 when my twins graduated high school. And so when they did, then that following December, I moved uh, to Kenya with Sarah. And we spent a year and a half there. And a lot of ways that was me saying, I'm just going to let go for a minute. Like I had been working so hard to, you know, build a career. I had just, you know, and at that point I had just come out of, like I'd had a really kind of a, quite a really good succession of, of experiences and of work and movies. I'd produced, I think in the couple of years before I moved, I think I'd produced four movies, two animated features, a documentary that I also directed, another one called Cage that, that just, I produced that just came out in January. So I'd had a, you know, things had been going pretty well but it was also a lot of work, <laughs> you know, like, like I, remember, I think I was 12, 30, like my big turnaround, I, I had a major shift that, that right around, when, right before my mother passed away. I'd had, you know, coming out of the last of the, with the great recession, my, the big hit for me on that was a little bit delayed, but I'd bought a house. I had, my, my kids were in private school. It was like all of these things. And then, you know, and then the economy crashed and I went back, I was waiting tables at night and man and tending bar and managing restaurants. And during the day I was either producing features or producing commercials. And I was doing like lower budget things. It wasn't, it was like, it was always like almost enough. And if it was consistent, it would have been fine. But, you know, kids keep eating and you know, the, the, the you know, mortgage collector keeps knocking every month, whether you're having a good month or not. And so I, I kept this like terrible restaurant job with a, with a pretty like overly difficult boss as a human being. And, and I just, and then at one point, like that summer before my mom died was just like, I, I got fired from that job. Like me and the, and the owner, finally, it just got to be too much. And so I was like, oh my gosh. And I have, and I had collected debt from, you know, from basically so many years of, you know, coming out of the great recession and my marriage was definitely like, I knew it was going. And then that same year, my mother died and I was like, man, I just about lost my house. My, you know, I lost a job. I lo almost lost my house. My marriage came to an end. My mother dies. It's like this cataclysm. And at the same time, there was also a real, like, there was this real sort of beauty in it, in, in that experience. And, you know, are you, so you're kind of like, you know, where, sort of where am I, right? So it was this, all of this stuff and just kind of holding life together. And one of the things that was always challenging in my, in, in, in my, in my first marriage was that I, how much of a practical person I am and how much I just like, I'll put everything on my shoulders and carry it, you know? And so there was, from a very practical standpoint, there was a lot of carrying and I'm also a fairly driven person. And so even when it was like during the day, I'm producing commercials to pay the bills and at night I'm, you know, waiting tables or tending bar to pay the rest of the bills. I'm still like getting up early to like work on writing a screenplay, you know, or doing some of my own project. And as soon as there's a little break, I, I mentioned that little, you know, stop motion animation, animated movie I did with my kids. I was like, oh, all of a sudden I, my days are free and the kids have a little bit of vacation. And, and since I'm, you know, I've got days free, let's make a little movie together. Like always kind of pushing, pushing. And 
you know, oh, I just need to relax. And so I'd imagined I was going to ride my bicycle around the world. And then I met Sarah and she was like, well, if you ride your bicycle around the world, we're going to be apart for two years. That's a long time. Why don't you move to Kenya with me? I was like, well, that, that sounds kind of crazy and kind of cool. So sure. So I did. And part of that move was just letting letting go, letting be what was going to be. And, uh, and it was wonderful. I did a ton of walking, climbed a lot of mountains. I, you know, I walked from where I lived to Mount Kenya and then climbed Mount Kenya, which is the second tallest peak on the continent. It's just a little shorter than Mount Kilimanjaro, snow on the top also. Just really opened up. I wrote a book, wrote, wrote two books actually, one which I sell on my website right now called The Creative's Handbook as a guide as a as a guide for people who want to create or who do create started the in the interracial couple podcast with Sarah just really kind of like opening stuff up and just waiting to see what is going to come what is the world asking of me when I was really ready to start doing, you know, making movies again. I, I had written a pilot that I rewrote to shoot in Kenya that we were slated to film just before, just after COVID hit. So we now were is, supposed to film it Kenya, two weeks. Is Kenya a hot yeah. video market? Because I know my friend, a good friend of mine from college is in Ethiopia and the film industry mm. is just booming there. Is that how Kenya is or not as Interesting. much? Interesting. It's not as much. I'd actually be curious to to talk to your friend or hear how it's going. I mean, in I have a, I do know this guy who sort of an acquaintance an acquaintance who I knew from ages ago moved to Uganda, but he had to make movies with the guy. But he was like there was one filmmaker there who he absolutely loved. He thought he was a genius and was like, I'm going to take my producing skills and go help this director. You know, Nigeria is in, is internationally renowned. Uh, for its film world, for its sort of film world, Kenya not so much. I think it needs it. There's certainly a lot of a lot of potential there. But it was also one reason why I was excited to be there. I was like, you know what? I have you know people with my amount of expertise. I have a very unique niche of expertise, which is that i have done a lot of things you know i i produced 10 million dollar features in hollywood which is not big budget but that's still an awful lot of money but i've also made feature films for you know under a hundred thousand dollars i have produced commercials for 10 grand and i produced commercials for two hundred fifty thousand dollars. and so I, I i i am deeply deeply acquainted with the entire process there are very few people who can make a movie on a hundred thousand dollars and on ten million dollars and actually know what they're doing there are very few people who know how to develop a script but then can also get all of de the deliverables and all of the legal deliverables and and asset deliverables for a studio delivery those are so i have this very unique broad a set of knowledge and like that's great for a place like Kenya because you'll need that and I there aren't there are very few people like me in Kenya there are a lot of people who know the film industry in Los Angeles so a lot of people who know it in Berlin in London in Paris in New York in Madrid but not a lot in Nairobi so I was kind of excited to bring my expertise there but you know, when COVID hit, we ended up not filming and then we came back to the States just for a visit and Sarah and her business, which is called Eco Dunia, and she makes bags and wallets, but primarily bags in Kenya and is selling them in the US. For her, it was like, she said, you know what, I'd like to have a year here to spend more time developing the market now that I spent a year and a half working with the craftspeople in Kenya and building that, those relationships. So it just became this thing of, oh, you know what, I think it's probably good for us to stay here. Uh, for a little while and we had this perfect place my brother had this cabin that needed some work and i didn't have coming back in the pandemic and not having any work and being having more greater time than money i said great let me just stay here i'll you know cover the costs of of what it is here and and fix the place up and i've been doing that and loving it it's 
you know, it's amazing. This little place is really nice now. <laughs> so we put in work and it's good during my days to get, pull myself away from the computer to go out and, you know, you know, cut down, cut down trees or lay floors or, you know, fix roofs and things like that. So it's, it's nice to be able to do that in between all the time I spend on computers. And so that's kind of, you know, this and, and really building this amazing life with, with Sarah. And I mentioned when we were in Kenya, she, we, she, when she launched Eco Dunia, she, she did a crowdfund to raise, you know, just to like raise just some money by pre-selling some bags. And so we had, you know, we filmed her and she, it was so uncomfortable for her. And I'd wanted to start a podcast for a while, but had, you know, I was blogging instead and writing my book and it just, it had never, and I was delivering my documentary called Hardball, the Girls of Summer about a few women in America who play baseball. And that's not softball, that's, that is baseball. I didn't misspeak. And so I just finished that movie and, and I had to deliver it because we had, we had sold it to a distributor. So there was all of this stuff going on. And, and then I, I was making this video for her and she was so uncomfortable. She said, you know what? Like maybe we should do a podcast together and we film it because I've got to get better being on camera. I was like, well, perfect. If it's something we do together, that's great. And so we started doing this podcast, the Interracial Couple Podcast. And I'm going to put links to all these in the show notes. So if you're listening or watching check out the show notes and you can see Matthew and Sarah's podcast, the books and all the projects they're doing. Awesome. And so we did. And, you know, at first it was a little bit, you know, it was, it was, you know, our, our place in Kenya had stone walls, uh, tile floors, it's super echoey. And we didn't really, you know, it was just kind of like getting into it and, and moving it along. And now we've, you know, we've, this afternoon, we'll record our 58th episode of the podcast. We record every week, come hell or high water. And that was kind of, you know, that was kind of getting that, getting into that with her. And, and, and so that was one of our things. And then we came back and she said, you know what? We have this pretty tremendous relationship. And, you know, and what are the things that make it so real, so amazing? And we brought some focus into that and we just went through it. And one of the things is, you know, I journal a lot. I'm a fairly regular journal, not necessarily every day, but certainly multiple times a week on average. And in our first two years together, we, we read a book and it was actually a book on money but it was really a spiritual journey that used sort of, it was really sort of about the spiritual relationship to money. And one of the things that it required was a lot of journaling and reflection. And since we spoke about forgiveness, some of the exercises were around forgiveness, about any incompletions that we had in other people's lives. And so we were journaling together and, and, you know, and, and I'll go back to, to when we first, we're together. And I think one of the reasons why our relationship is so fantastic is we didn't actually try to impress each other. The first time we went out, it wasn't a date. We went out because we, we basically had mutual friends and we had said we were going to just like have a conversation over coffee, just turned into, you know, drinks in the evening. And like, the way she talked to me too, like I had, it was, it was, I had a big, I had a, a leftover mega mustache from November. So I used to grow <laughs> a big mustache every November. And that year I just hadn't shaved it off, but I was loving it. It was just like this big, like Wyatt Earp thing. And I can't believe she fell in love with me. There's nothing she hates more than a mustache. And <laughs> in fact, we were hanging out and she, I was like, oh, so what do you do? And she said, you know, I have an online business. I sell things online. And, and I said, oh, that's cool. And she said, but you know what? I could never sell men's razors because I would just give them away. I'd say, please take these for free and shave that crap off your face. <laughs> nice. That's like, what you call a subtle hint, right? Yeah. It, yeah, exactly. Super subtle. 
uh, and she took just these like these she's very funny and she took these just really like kind of both funny and barbed sort of jabs at my life for you know for obviously having like premarital sex for having you know for having a kid as a teenager like she just was like jabbing but there was no nastiness to it it was all in just this wonderful humor that she could just poke fun and she felt so comfortable and even also like right away at the beginning like when it became like the second time we hung out and there was definitely like energy between us that was quite palpable and we'd gone out to eat that evening with really one of our two mutual we had two mutual friends that were like you know actually like you know friends and i guess she really just won and that friend was like we she mentioned that she was hanging out with me that day and she said oh i'll take you guys out to eat um, we'll go out to eat together so we all went out to eat and on the way back she just she asked questions she was just like and she shared things with me that nobody shares with each other right away you know just past mistakes experiences we had where we've come from all this stuff it was basically almost like i'm going to try and scare you off but it wasn't even that so much it was just like we're going to if if there's going to be anything here it's going to be built on integrity and and honesty and that also basically means honesty in a way that if I'm going to be vulnerable and honest with you and I'm going to share with you the mistakes that I've made or even the mistakes that I've made even if it's and if you want to you get into a relationship at the beginning it's easy oh that was a past mistake well how about a relationship when you've been in it for 4 years and you did something that really hurt your your partner or your spouse last week or yesterday you know can you immediately fess up to your mistake or you know or you or a shortcoming or whatever can you point out the other shortcoming without being blamey like that was you made a mistake or what you just did really hurt my feelings or whatever that is and so that just building on that honesty and was pretty like pretty profound so anyway we came back from Kenya and hey just entire to plans there, were, just to interject yeah. there too what's unique about your situation is most people the culture you come from and the more similar your background is the easier it is to get along and, and to gel and you guys probably had very mm -hmm. drastically different backgrounds and cultures yet you congealed so well so that's really interesting how god worked that out mm. well you know that is now and we we've also we kind of like wonder how is that you know how could it be so awesome you know she was definitely a a an oddball in a lot of ways <laughs> in like where like in in her you know, culturally she's quite unique but when she moved to the state she found herself her her host mother did like they were bi-weekly women's groups and so she, there was a lot of work with these women where they got where they came together and uh, sort of bared or bore their souls to each other where it wasn't about about trying to impress somebody it was about like being honest and vulnerable and real and so there was this great practice that she had had in that and i too had kind of come from from you know had done a lot of a lot of work on growth we both question our assumptions we're both we both don't mind being wrong you know and it's one of these things that's amazing like sometimes we'll get into an argument about something and very often it'll be like you know if we do one of us very often will kind of come afterwards and be like if it's clear say for example that i did something like i'm in the wrong in this argument um like oh like okay like even if i don't totally see it your way you know what? i'm really i'm going to really think about that like let's come back to this cuz it's like if i come if i've come across to you in such and such a way and i didn't see it that way if that is actually the way i was acting and i was unaware of that i need to think about that so thank you for pointing that out 
And if it turns out you were right and I was wrong, let's say I thought I was being kind and, and or I was like pointing out maybe like one example was I, I made a joke about, it was like two jokes in succession about her drinking. And Sarah's not like a drinker, but she'll have, when we go out, she'll have a couple glasses of wine or whatever. And I just, I made a joke about it in a way that just wasn't cool, you know? And she brought it up and she was upset with me. And, and it wasn't that I had any intention of it, of it like, you know, of goading her or making any sort of innuendos about anything but I did. And when she pointed that out to me, I was like, you know what? I'm in the wrong here. And I could have defended it and been like, you're overreacting, you're seeing that wrong or whatever. That's not how I meant it. And at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? A, it's not necessarily how I meant it consciously, but if I think about it, I can also see, for example, that like my dad made comments about to my mother about things like that with like her eating. And so you kind of now I'm, behavior. yes. So now I am, I'm not, that comment was totally out of line because it wasn't out of freedom. It was out of a family pattern that I had of it's okay to, you know, to point it out because maybe like, you know, maybe this week for whatever reason you drink more than you normally would or whatever, you know? So and maybe it was opportunity. Like none of those things even matter. You know what I mean? I was totally out of line. And so like that would have been an example where like, there is no problem, but I chose because, because Sarah is quite honestly so freaking amazing and as like um, just, just shockingly wonderful human being, a lot of the things like it's almost like if, if there's a problem, and it's not to say she doesn't have her fault. She's got, you know, she's also human. She's, she's human too. Yeah, we um, all do, right? We all but, do. Yeah, we all do. But but it's like there are times where like I have to find something, you know? Like, so I'm just going to revert to some old pattern so that I can find something wrong so I can bring some negativity into my relationship because I'm just not used to having a relationship that is so fantastic. Anyway, so that's kind of this kind of long way around of, I, I don't mind being wrong. She doesn't mind being wrong. And, and if I don't bring it up, sometimes, you know, if we're getting into a little bit of a heated debate, sometimes she'll just stop and say, okay, let's just look at it completely from your point of view for a moment, you know, like in a way that's like where there's just no like giving up or stank or negativity, but we both kind of like, here's the thing. If, I, if you and I get in an argument and you're right and I, and I learn that I was wrong and you're right, guess who actually wins that argument? I do because I just gained something, okay? But if we're in an argument and at the end of the day, you're like, hey, Matthew, you know what? Actually, you're right. I didn't gain anything except maybe a little feeling of pride, which is totally an unbeneficial feeling for pride, but you just gain new knowledge and understanding. So being wrong is actually the way better place to be in, 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 in any kind of conversation, argument, disagreement. It's better to be wrong than to be right. So you're kind of learning and growing together. Yes. Yes. So anyway, we came back and I was going to, make this document. I was going to make this, shoot this pilot and start this TV series in Kenya. That didn't happen. All of a sudden we're like here in, in California and we're like, what, what are we, what are we going to do? We have to change all of our plans. And she said, you know, we have this, this gift that we could really be offering. And so she and I developed the lover's journal and it's based, it's a, it's a prompted journal for couples. And it's, you know, has 52 weekly prompts, monthly challenges, inside, you know, inspirational and insightful quotes. And, and it just kind of, it leads through some really fun and easy stuff. And also through some sort of wonderfully challenging stuff in relationships. And that's something that we've, you know, that we've been doing together. And that's still fairly new for us. 
It's being carried in its first local bookstore here. We launched our website just a couple, two or three weeks ago. Um, still not a hundred percent done. You know, we're still doing our SEO and backend stuff on it. And um, you know, just actually today we finally sent in a bunch of them into Amazon to sell them on Amazon. And, nice. So, and again, we'll uh, put a link to that in the show notes so they can actually buy off Amazon. But this is going to air in probably about four weeks from the day we're recording. So you think in a month it'll be available to purchase? It definitely will be. Awesome. It's, it's available right now on our website. It'll be on Amazon to purchase. And we'll make sure to get a, we'll get, we can make sure to get a, both links and we'll do some special code for everyone who's listening here. We'll do some kind of discount code for everyone here. Let me just check in with Sarah, but we'll do something and make sure to put that in the show notes as well. Yeah, absolutely. What I'll do is when this is over, the, the, our listeners know that at the end of the episode, we always do a special promotion. So we'll go ahead yeah. and put a special promo code in for the Lover's Journal. So stick around to the end and you'll be able to get yours at a discounted rate. And we'll have the link right there for you. Beautiful. So that's, so, you know, and that's been a, that has been a, you know, that's been a focus and a really exciting focus for me in the last in the last couple months. And, you know, as a, as a writer, as an, and as a filmmaker, that stuff is always, you know, it's something that I always do. As I mentioned, you know, in the last, well, in the last year and a half, I had two movies that came out and both of them are available on iTunes and Amazon prime and, and, and all that. So I can put some links in there and, and something that I just get so much joy and appreciation out of is, is helping others because something that I've done in my life that I really like when I look back on my life and I think, what are the things that I'm proud of? And I'm proud of my children and sort of who I was as a father. I am proud of myself as a, as a life partner because of the effort that I put in. Sure. Recognizing their mistakes, but I've grown and learned so much, but it's also actually been as a, as a creative human being. And I feel like people have stories and our, each of our stories has a tremendous amount of value. And it's something that kind of, it's, it's ours, it belongs to us, you know, as individuals. Like my story is unique, your story is unique. And when you have a story, there are many ways of expressing that story. So one is like, oh, my story, this was my life and I wanna share that. And the other is, my story is I have a way of seeing the world through and, and, and I express that through photography or through painting or through sketching. It may be through sharing some insight or knowledge on a podcast. It may be that you know my grandfather or grandmother was this amazing person and they have a story. And part of my story is knowing that I came from that and I want to tell that story of, you know, of theirs and but so many people don't tell those stories because we want to do it justice. And so in some ways it's better in our minds and our silly minds to not do it at all rather than do it imperfectly. And something that I'm really proud of in my life is that I've always been creating something. You know, it's like, it's my, it's almost been my mantra is, is my ABC is my always be creating. Um, nice. Instead it, of always be closing, always be creating. Exactly. It's always be creating. And, you know, and when I, I it's, I, I mean, always. And, you know, it, and whether it was early on making music and making a CD or whether it was when I was not creating as much in the way of sort of artistic expression, like after I made my first movie, and between then called Senses of Place. And when I moved to Hollywood, I spent a year in Sacramento and I studied with a man named Dennis Klocek in a program that he ran at the Rudolf Steiner College at the time called Consciousness Studies. And so I wasn't writing a screenplay. I wasn't making anything like that. And I founded a nonprofit during that period of time called We Strive at westrive.org. And like, always stuff. And then I began, then I was writing, writing articles for Lillipo magazine, just really, really engaged. And, and when I look back at a certain point, particularly coming out of the great recession, where I, why coming right out of the great recession was my career 
did it take off? And a lot of people had kind of, you know, had really struggled during that period of time and struggled for a long time afterwards to get back on their feet. It becomes during that time, I made, I think, at least two feature films. And they were both ultra low budget movies that I made. One I made, no, no, both of them I made almost no money on. I made a little bit, but not very much money doing them. So I worked a ton making two feature films that I made no, basically no money on. I directed a short film. And from that short film, this guy who produced it with me at the same time was starting a commercial production company and they had connections, but they didn't actually know how to produce to the level of what they were being asked to do. The, the first gig was a commercial for a Nintendo game that was made by Warner Brothers Games. And they were like, this is really important. It's a really low budget thing uh, comparatively, but it's for a, you know, it's a big account. And if we can, if we can blow their socks off, we'll have a ton of work and we'll be able to really launch this company. So they hired me and sure enough, we blew their socks off. We did a really good job. And for the next couple of years, I was like, you know, I was making a ton of stuff with them. Whenever there was work, I was doing it because I was like, I was their ace in the hole when it came to being able to execute high level work on a tight timeline and tight budgets. And when that wasn't happening, as I mentioned, you know, my, my kids and I made a, it was like, oh, I've been spending all this time working nights in restaurants to, you know, pay, pay the mortgage and pay for the kids to go to private school. And by day I'm producing commercials and, you know, and music videos and stuff. And all of a sudden I had this, this period of time where I was like, oh, my days were free. I was like, let's, I had this idea for a little short film called Animal Cookies about this little this girl who, who gets, who has like a toy kitchen and bakes animal cookies in her toy kitchen. They come to life. It's cute. We're super cute. Oh, nice. And is it available publicly like on YouTube or where can people? Find yeah. It? Yeah. I'll, we'll, we'll put a free YouTube link. It's, it's, it's less than two minutes long. It's super short. But like there was that, you know, and this was just something I, I literally, I did it in my garage with my, with my, with my children over, over Thanksgiving break. And it took me a year to finally assemble it all. Cause it's, I don't know, it's, well, it's 24 frames for every, for every second, right? That's a lot of frames, but then it turned out pretty good. And so I submitted it, sent it out to a few film festivals and we, we played in film festivals all over the world. We played in Europe, Australia, all over the US. We won a couple of awards. And so when I say like my pride is not so much in like, oh, I made this thing and I, I and, and people loved it and I won these awards because I made also a lot of stuff that nobody ever cared about that didn't win any awards or whatever, but that I did it and that it didn't matter. And so at this point in my life, one thing I love doing is I've launched another podcast actually, it's called Tapping Creativity. There's going to be so many links in this, in these show notes. People are going to like, they're going to be like, forget it. This guy's an idiot. He, that's too many things to click on. Oh, that's um, all right. Just get me what you got and we'll organize it. <laughs> the listeners, if you're out there, you're going to have the ability to go through the show notes and on the website, just decently in order. Just go through them as you see fit and check it out. It's, it's, it's going to, it's, it's like, it, yeah, it's going to be Baskin Robbins and 31 flavors. But so I made these little, this, you know, and so the thing that's I, I'm really excited about is, all right, so I think, so I even, I started this podcast called Tapping Creativity because so often people come to me and be like, oh, like I, I've been wanting to write a screenplay for 20 years, or I've really been wanting to, you know, I've, I've, I've written a few songs, but I really want to record them and make, you know, put them up on SoundCloud or on Spotify or something. But then people don't do it. And to me, that's so sad, you know, because to me, there are a million ways to interpret that we were made in God's image. But one of the ways that I love to interpret that is that we have the capacity, the ability, and the capability to create something from nothing. And when we do that, it is enlivening. It puts us in a it puts us in a, in a divine space, which is intimidating. And I think it's one of the things that holds people back is like, 
wait a second, that's big work. And if I am going to spend five years writing a novel, or if I'm going to spend two years writing a screenplay and two years raising money to do it and, and three years fi- you know, finally filming and putting it together, I want it to be really good. And it might not be. <laughs> and that's got to be okay. And if you're going to do it, you know, I, 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 I mostly I do a lot of, of either screenwriting, teaching screenwriting or, or, or sort of coaching or mentoring or, or consulting for filmmakers or people want to make movies. That's where I do most of my work. I also work with musicians and stuff too and other artists. But, but, you know, but screenplay is probably where I spend the most time. And I get people, you know, young students all the time are like, oh, I want this to be really good. I say, you've never done it before. So it's not going to be good. Your first screenplay will not be good. And they're like, oh, but I'm going to spend so much time. Yeah, yeah, you will. And guess what? The first time a surgeon operates, they're not going to do a good operation, which is guess what? Why they don't operate on a real person when they first start operating. They operate on a cadaver, right? You basically, you're going to operate on somebody that's already dead because you're going to do such a bad job. And guess what? Being a creator is so hard that the first time you do it is going to do such a bad job. But you can't, there's no such thing as a dead screenplay that's just going to show up there for you to, to do your first, like your first, your first surgery on. So you could have to invent your first terrible screenplay or your first dead screenplay and then rework that over and over and over again. It's going to be bad. It's going to be dead. And you know what? And it's not to say that you won't get it to be good enough at some point and maybe make it. That does happen sometimes. Sometimes your first screenplay ends up being good, but your first draft is God awful guaranteed 100% of the time because you don't know what you're doing. You've never done it before. So, so what would you that, give as advice to people who are trying to be creative? Like, are there steps to the first time you do this? Hey, here's the outline. One, two, three. What would you recommend to those creators? Well, I would say I talk about that's, that's actually what my book goes into. And I will give you the very quick overview. It's what I call the seven P's for powerful and effective creating. And the first is like picking your project, which is also getting really clear about your project. So that is, for example, like, hey, I want to, I want to write a, you know, I want to write a book about, I don't know, about a woman who was the first woman to use a computer in, in Douglas Aircraft and in aerospace in America. Cool. Okay. Well, that's a cool book. Is that going to be a novel? Turns out that's the story of my grandmother. So is that going to be a, a biography of my grandmother? Am I going to use her to inspire a novel? Is that actually better going to be done as a documentary? Is that going to be better to be done as a series of articles or as a short story? So getting really clear, picking your project. And then from picking your project, now you need to go into planning. Once you've planned it, then preparation. And then you go into process, you know, setting up what is your process. And that is really going to be different for everybody. So for me, I don't have any young children. So I can get up and I can write two hours first thing every day. That's an option I have. That can be part of my process. But what I also might find is that two hours first thing in the morning might not be very good because I might not function quite as well until 10 a.m. So maybe I need to do it at 10 a.m. But I also might say, you know what, I'm feeling really ambitious but I'm a single mother and I really want to like write and have this book done this year. And that would have been in kind of the, in, in the, uh, in the planning stage would be sort of setting out what are your smart goals and everything. That way you kind of know what you're going to hit, but you might find that, Oh wait, you know what? I said I was going to write three times a week, but if I'm, it's so hard for me, really the only time I can do it is like Saturday morning at 10 a.m., I can drop my kids off at my neighbor's house for two hours. I go sit at Starbucks or the local cafe, and I write for two hours. That's all the time I have. That's part of your practice, getting to know what your process is. Once you figure out your process, then you put it into a practice. And you need to get into a rhythm. Once you're in that, then it's patience and perseverance, right? So you go through, like, it just takes time. So a lot of times we think, hey, you know what? Like, I want to make a movie. 
And when I made my documentary, I know that people can take 10 years to make a documentary and that's pretty easy. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to make this documentary in a year. Like that is what I'm going to do. Well, I didn't make that documentary in a year. I want to say it was maybe two and a half years. But thank goodness that I said that I was so dead set on doing it in a year. Because if I had said, oh, this might take me three years, it probably would have taken me nine. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. That's how it works, right? It, because, right. Like, it's just, it's a creative process. You're making something from nothing. You're putting yourself in divine space of being a creator. So that's pretty tough. So it's patience and perseverance. And then kind of like what's sometimes like my... My eighth P or the one that's overall is purpose. You know, what are you doing this for? And being really clear on that. That way, you know, it's like if it's your purpose, if your purpose is clear, then I often kind of say that you probably heard about this mother. There's a story I remember it was in the newspaper back in the 80s. This mother lifted a car off of her child. Her child had been like run over by a car and she lifted up the car. And you know what? For a woman to lift up a car is impossible. It's also impossible to write your first novel or even not your first novel. Writing a novel is impossible. Making a movie is impossible. These things are like impossible, but yet it happens. How does the impossible happen? Purpose. The woman who lifted a car off her child had the purpose of saving her child, a purpose so great that she could do the impossible. When we're clear about our purpose of why we're showing up to doing it, we can do the impossible. So, so actually anybody who reaches out to me, I do have a, the beginning of that I give away for free, which is really kind of setting setting up the smart goals, getting out your get your project, and really you know beginning on setting your your planning your your planning phase, and kind of setting you off on the road. So that 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 I always give away for free, and actually also anyone who's listening, I always will do a you know a, at least one one free call, and really just kind of like get in with anybody what what is holding them back. Because it is unique and there aren't many, like it's both unique and it's universal in that there are, you know, there are, you're going to fall into a category and your story is unique, but the thing that's holding you back is usually falls into, you know, one of like four or five categories. And once you know that, then you actually say, oh, well, now I know what's holding me back and now I can put my effort into that as opposed to being like, oh, there's this one size fits all or these things that gurus show up and say, hey, do my system and it'll work miracles for you. Like, it doesn't work that way. Your system worked for you given your, your situation. But, you know, a hammer, you know, yeah, if, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And if the hammer is the tool that you have, you're going to want to go and bang everything in. But that's just not always the tool. So it's just getting to know what, what your unique challenges are. So that way you can actually get the necessary tool you need. And that, so kind of coming, circling back, that's where I have so much, like I'm both proud of that in my life that I've been able to always be with. I mean, I had that thing where I had three kids and two jobs and a wife and all that stuff and was still making movies and was still writing screenplays and still founded a nonprofit. And, and, and not everyone can do what I do. I get that. But Everybody can get their story out there. Everybody can create. Everyone can do that thing they say, I've been dreaming of doing. Everyone can do that. And so I take so much joy in my life and helping people. And I, I love it. I just, I love it so much. I had this one client. I'll just tell you about her briefly because it was so wonderful. And she was one of my first clients. We, I was in, and it's actually, the reason why I even started saying, you know, I'm going to help other people was my kids were getting ready to graduate. My youngest were getting ready to graduate high school. And I was standing next to these two women who both had their daughters on the basketball team. And one of them, her youngest was also graduating high school and she was quite a bit older, you know, she's older than me. And I was like, wow. So now that, you know, your final kid is flowing the coop, what are you going to do? And she said, well, you know, for, 20 years, I've been wanting to write a screenplay. So I think I'm going to take a little sabbatical and I'm going to write. At the same time, I'm talking to this other woman who has, you know, who is a single mother of two and really struggled so much and, and really struggling to be a creative. She was, you know, act, an actress, but also a writer and really wanted to be a filmmaker and always coming up against, there was always some issue in her life. And at that point, her issue was she had had a full-time job 
And for the first time in her life, she, for a while, she had more plenty of money to support her family with. But at this moment we're talking, she had gotten cut down to half time. And she said, I am at half time and I can barely pay my bills. And I was feeling so good. And I said, you realize you've actually just hit the jackpot. Because as an artist, you only have to work 25 hours a week to make, to, to, you know, to cover your nut. That means you just freed up 25 hours and you can now put 25 hours a week into your creativity, into your art. And so, and still pay your, pay your bills. That's amazing. So kind of like leaving that, I stopped, I went back and I thought, you know, this is, I called her up and I said, you know, I want to do something for you. Now, I want to spend this next year, I'm going to mentor you. And so I was working with her over the course of this year. And, and someone who had struggled to be creative her whole life or to find the time to be creative and express herself creatively. The end of her, at the end of our year working together, well, 10 months actually, I get an email from her and I quoted in my, in my book because it was so inspirational. This woman who had struggled for so long to just pay her bills as a single mother of two, she writes me from Costa Rica. She had pulled nice. her kids out of, out, of, out, of, out of school for a while. She went to Costa Rica. She said, I'm sitting at my desk overlooking the ocean and I just submitted my first article for this woman who hired me. And it was like the work that we did together. Obviously she did her own work. She had to do the work, right? I didn't do any of the work for her, but through guiding her from being like, I, I'm not living a life that I'm being fulfilled or I'm feeling fulfilled as a writer to helping her clarify, becoming really clear in herself, finding out what her strengths were to getting an email from her from Costa Rica sending off this project. I thought, oh my God, it felt so good. And it was a major inspiration for me. And I continue to do that work when I'm not writing, directing, producing my own projects. That's awesome. Yeah. Those are the moments that just make it all worthwhile, right? Exactly. So now exactly. if someone's listening today and they want to get a hold of you, Matthew, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yeah, I'm really easy to find on social media at Matthew C. Temple. Uh, Matthew C. Temple. MatthewCTemple.com is my website. Uh, you can email me through that. But yeah, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, it's all Matthew, at Matthew C. Temple. And I, I'm a pretty easy guy to find. And uh, when you do find me, drop me a line. I'm a fun person to talk to, and I'm always happy to be of service. It's what brings the greatest joy into my life is being of service. Well, thank you for being here today. I really enjoyed our conversation. I, it's been so interesting and learned a ton. Is there anything from your past, your present, or where you're going in the future we missed before we wrap this up for the day? You know what? We missed a lot, but, you know, fortunately, life is long and the world is small. And uh, so we'll have to fill in the gaps, I think, you know, as, as, we, move, as we move forward and in, in other places. Because I feel like in, this has been a... Uh, this has been, we've taken quite a journey and I am super honored and grateful that you have provided this space, uh, the great questions. And as a host, you've really sort of, you know, I feel like I've been able to be really open and honest and expressing. And I want to honor you as the person who's created this container for that, as I'm, I'm really grateful and thankful for what you have, how you've held this and given me this opportunity to share my story and hopefully inspired at least one or two people along the way. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. And Matthew, I really thank you for being on the show. Ladies and gentlemen, stick around for another couple minutes. We've got a special offer for you. And then reach out to Matthew. Check out the show notes. Look at the short video, the stop animation video he made with his kids. We love you. And like our slogan says, don't just listen to this episode with Matthew, but do the knowledge that he imparted, act on it, repeat it daily, and have a great life. I'm David Pasqualone. This is the Remarkable People Podcast. Our guest today is Matthew Temple, and we'll see you next week. Ciao. The Remarkable People Podcast. Check it out.
The Remarkable People Podcast. Listen. Do. Repeat. For life.